I'm just waiting for the signal. So as soon as I get it. Good afternoon, I'm Lisa Gibbs and welcome to the AP Davos debate. Our topic today, South Asia and its future. On a day when the people of Pakistan are mourning the loss of life, it's only appropriate to give first word to the Prime Minister of Pakistan. You've said you want to eliminate terrorism for your com from your country. Is this possible? How will you achieve that? Well, uh, uh, <clears throat> Pakistan has taken a very uh, decisive action against uh, terrorists. Uh, <clears throat> when I took office in 2013, uh, the terrorists uh, were creating havoc uh, all over the country. And then we, uh, all of us sat down. I invited uh, all the heads of the political parties we jointly decided to uh, conduct an operation against uh, these elements, in the, especially in the tribal areas of Pakistan, bordering uh, Afghanistan. And <clears throat> it was a very uh, carefully, you see, calculated decision. So we deployed 180,000 troops in those areas and started this operation. This operation yielded very good results and so far we've been able to you see uh, uh, you see destroy their infrastructure dismantle their networks hideouts and sanctuaries and uh, this has broken their back we knew that uh, the blowback could be severe it was severe <clears throat> but then of course started reducing and now uh, the terrorists are on the run. They are picking up soft targets. You see, in yesterday's uh, uh, attack on a university was a soft target that they had picked up. But overall, <clears throat> their ability now to strike back has been considerably destroyed. So Pakistan has uh, paid a very heavy price in terms of lives, which of course, uh, are run into tens of thousands, and of course, hundred more than hundred billion dollars of economic losses that we've suffered. But I think uh, our resolve to fight against these elements is getting stronger every day. How important are solving these problems to your country's economic future? Pardon me. How important are solving these problems to your economic future? It's very important because. Uh, the challenges that we inherited immediately after taking office uh, uh, were three basic uh, challenges. One is uh, the challenge of economic revival and uh, uh, address the issue of uh, power shortage. And third was the uh, scourge of uh, terrorism that we wanted to eliminate. So I think we've been successful in all these three fronts. And <clears throat> with uh, the uh, terrorism coming down in Pakistan, militancy reducing, the economy is picking up. Uh, from, we inherited uh, uh, a GDP growth rate of about 3%, uh, which is now uh, over 4.2%, and we're expecting uh, uh, to have 5% growth rate within this financial year. The inflation is down to 2%, and unemployment is also decreasing very sharply. And at the same time, <clears throat> the uh, uh, revenues are increasing. I think uh, uh, the increase uh, of this year is about 33% in the revenues. So I think it's a, it's a very good turnaround which is taking place in Pakistan. And investment, uh, you see, <clears throat> is uh, uh, taking place in the country, both foreign investment. And we also have uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor 
which is a $46 billion investment that is taking place in Pakistan in, in three different sectors, infrastructure and uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, power sector and railways. So this is not only going to benefit Pakistan or China, this is going to benefit the entire region. I think Pakistan is on the right track. Mr. Nakal, one more question about security and then we'll move on to other issues. Uh, the Asian Development Bank has said that security and political stability are one of the challenges for the region in transforming. How, how concerned are you about this? Of course, uh, this is a really, uh, uh, I'm so saddened by this instance uh, because uh, security, uh, safety and uh, political stability, all these conditions are very important for development and uh, what I want to stress uh, now in the beginning is that uh, South Asia has uh, grown, has uh, had a lot of progress in terms of uh, macroeconomic stabilities and growth rate and so on because uh, they pay more attention to market-based uh, growth instead of uh, control and uh, there is a progress in uh, governance and uh, of course uh, challenges remain for infrastructure, skill, skills gaps and so on. But of course, uh, security is uh, the main important uh, uh, issue for uh, uh, continued uh, development. Uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, there are still challenges, but uh, in other countries, uh, more or less, uh, it is uh, uh, more stable. So I hope uh, the uh, Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan will regain uh, stability and security soon. We know that prosperity for the region does depend on being at peace, not at war, but certainly there are other major issues and challenges. Let's talk about job creation and poverty in the region. Um, South Asia has the world's largest population of young people. Where are their jobs going to come from? Um, in Sri Lanka, what are some of the things you're doing to help develop the skills of your young people and create jobs for them? Firstly, we are restructuring an economy which was dependent on uh, foreign employment earnings, apparels, uh, commodities for exports. So we, we want to make Sri Lanka a hub for the global value chain and uh, a platform for competitive value addition. So we will open, open this out. We are going out into having agreements. We already got FTA with Pakistan. We want to further it. FT with India will become economic and technology agreement going back into the GSP plus another two FTAs with Singapore and China and that opens out the market. As the skills are concerned, we are looking at a public-private partnership uh, of uh, having people being trained for jobs. That, that would really be geared onto the private sector because they've all been complaining that the biggest, one of the biggest constraints to us uh, <clears throat> growth you're going to be skills. So, okay, come and uh, have to take over the whole uh, issue of training for employment or training for the job market. That will be a public-private partnership. We, might, we are even looking at whether we should have uh, social inclusion bonds uh, for the private sector to come in. But uh, they, they benefit directly as, as long as, as once you start supplying the required skills. But it's going up to the next level. We cannot be a low-wage economy anymore, <coughs> even in the whole region and in the Bay of Bengal. So now we've got to look at ourselves as how we go up and look at the salary scale, wage scale more in line with Thailand or Malaysia. Young people have aspirations. And you have to meet the aspirations. Otherwise, we have underemployment. You can, we, can, we have been creating employment, but people are not satisfied. Then there's a question of, uh, education of their children, uh, education of the, the health care, housing. So this is one, one major issue, uh, project we have called the Million Jobs Program, for which we mobilize the private capital. Go ahead. Ms. Kochar, I'm wondering, you know, in India, 350 million Indians are expected to enter the workforce in the next 10 years. What is happening in, in your country to develop skills to make sure they can find those jobs? Yes, so I think both about job creation and skill development. Uh, as you rightly said, very young country, uh, you know, almost 40% of our population is less than 20 years. And we add almost about 10 million people every year to the working age group. Uh, so first, we have to create jobs for them. And secondly, we have to 
skillfully uh, kind of employ them. Uh, so far, India has been growing at the back of services sector growth. But you know, if you see, uh, what we are now doing is promoting manufacturing as, as one another big uh, area of growth. So the entire make in India concept, that manufacturing sector itself is expected to give rise to about 90 million jobs over the next one decade. Uh, the third area of growth, and in, in that sense, employability creation, is the entire innovation sector, where we are saying stand up India, innovate India, creating small entrepreneurs at the back of use of technology and innovation. So I think in terms of creating job, we are shifting from being only services focused to getting manufacturing and innovation and technology focused. In terms of skill, again, we have a huge gap to meet uh, because uh, you know while we add so many people to the working age group, it's believed that a very small percentage of people who join the workforce are actually formally trained. So again, uh, you know, uh, the entire India is working towards what we call the Skill India program, <coughs> which the government has launched. Uh, of course, the initiative by the government, but looking at huge amount of public-private partnership, as we said, uh, the target is to kind of uh, skillfully train about 400 million people by 2022. And this cannot be done by private sector alone, by government alone. So uh, as I said, a huge amount of public-private partnership. To just give you examples, you know, many of the corporates sitting in this room are in their own way contributing to how to skill people in different skills. These are not necessarily just computers or web designing, but for instance, even at ICICI, though we are a bank, we run about 22 skill training centers all over the country in 13 different skills, like uh, air conditioning repair, electrical repair, uh, you know, sales skills, and so on, and train about 50,000 youth, young people uh, per annum. So I think that's what every corporate is trying to do, and along with government, uh, that's the Skill India program. And what about in Pakistan, Mr. Prime Minister, the issues around the skills and, and what are some of the things that you're doing to help increase job growth? Well, we also have a population <clears throat> of uh, over 180 million people and 70% uh, <clears throat> of uh, this population is below the average, you see, is below the age of uh, 30. And uh, <clears throat> well, of course, uh, there are a lot of uh, institutions which are now uh, providing uh, different skills to all these people. And at the same time, the government has also launched various schemes, uh, uh, including the SMEs, and government is now pumping more money into uh, these organizations so that they can provide uh, uh, easy loans to the applicants. And of course, I think this is now uh, gaining momentum in Pakistan. And among these people who are being uh, considered for giving loan on very, you see, easy terms, 50% are females. And uh, the government, it, it, it was uh, during our government, we decided to have 50% uh, women in this scheme, and the women are also benefiting greatly from the scheme. And other, other than the ones that I've just mentioned, the government is focusing its energies on, on this particular, because we want our <clears throat> young people and SMEs to form part of the the uh, the uh, in, the major uh, uh, you see um, industry that will produce uh, uh, goods for export as well as for Pakistani markets. Professor Yunus, I wonder, having listened to the discussion of skills training and efforts being made to help young people find jobs, is it enough? Uh, sh what else should be done? Well, I've been taking a kind of opposite view of it. I'm not too much on job creation part of it. Uh, I think that's the wrong direction, job creation part of it. Uh, I think our education system and our government policies are responsible for it. I think human beings, particularly young generation that's coming up today, is a completely different uh, setup uh, with the creative, creativeness inside of them because of the technology of it. Uh, human beings are not born to work for somebody else. Human beings are basically entrepreneurs, but somehow we have given them a wrong orientation that you have to find a job for, do it, uh, make it uh, a life for yourself. So I was trying to encourage the young people in Bangladesh to believe um, by saying that we are not job seekers, we are job creators. So that you think like a job creator so you can bring entrepreneurship, 
um, from yourself. Uh, why do we say that? What gives me the uh, kind of um, push to make such a statement? I'm very impressed by the way um, Grameen Bank and the borrowers of Grameen Bank, how they behave, how they function, the microcredit globally, how they could do it. Uh, basically, uh, Grameen Bank and uh, similar other programs all over the region, they address the women, mostly rural women, mostly illiterate women. Uh, they take small money and start a business. Uh, so I'm raising this with the children of those families who have been with microcredit. If your illiterate mother can start a business, what good is your education if you're not as good as your mother, illiterate mother? Why can't you start a business yourself? What's wrong with you? Uh, the wrong is the orientation around them because they are trained by education system to produce their school diplomas and to find a job uh, instead of using their own creative power. So what we are doing now, create uh, what we call social business funds, encourage young people to come out with business ideas. Uh, as soon as they come with the business ideas, we invest in their businesses, tiny, tiny businesses, and we become partners <clears> with them <throat> so that they become successful business person and pay us back the money that we invested and become the full owner of those things. So that's the direction I see possibilities because a job doesn't really take your creative power. <clears throat> it uses only a small part of your power. You still have enormous power inside of you. Unleashing that creative power is the most important part of it. So I would rather... Uh, go in that direction, not that I'm shutting down all the uh, uh, job-seeking uh, uh, thing, because you can't do it right away, but having the millions of women in, in the whole region uh, through microcredit becoming entrepreneurs gives us a hope that uh, the same creative power exists and more multiplied by their education to become entrepreneurs. It's a question of uh, ecosystem that we built around it, financial system, because nobody will, uh, no banking system will give them a loan to start a business at the level. So it's a fault of the system, uh, financial system, denying that. So they block that out. That's not possible for me. All I can do is take a job. Even in taking a job, you spend a lot of money finding a job and bribing people to get a job. You spend money. So to say that you don't have money is not also possible. You already spend money to find a job, bribe the job, uh, by, uh, job givers. So you have some facilities and ability to start a business yourself, but you need a financial system to back it up. So I'll rather focus on entrepreneurship. And, and in this region that we are talking about <coughs> is a, a tradition of entrepreneurship. It's built into it all, at all levels, from rural level to the urban level. Why don't we exploit that? I think you bring up two important issues. I'm guessing that the prime ministers and Ms. Kochar would say that their countries want to very much encourage entrepreneurship. Um, what are some of the things your country is doing to help the formation of business in addition to getting jobs? Are there some interesting efforts underway there? Yeah. So uh, one is, as I said, um, you know, there's a huge focus on creating entrepreneurs um, through the small innovation uh, that, that we want to promote in the country. So we call it Stand Up India, Innovate India, and so on, where we, we are, the government has said that they are going to make the you know, ability to do business, to start up businesses, for them to have funding available, et cetera, much easier and uh, you know, uh, more accessible so that they can actually become entrepreneurs. Uh, but, you know, talking on a much bigger concept about uh, the financial system working with the people to create livelihoods. And I would use the word livelihood, uh, be it employment, be it entrepreneurship. But how does the financial system help people gain more livelihood? I think India has done a tremendous job over here because in the last uh, one and a half years or so, we've actually expanded our financial inclusion efforts substantially. Uh, and uh, it's not just about getting the number of people included into banking. So in about 18 months, we opened, the banks opened about 200 million accounts of people who were unbanked so far, so brought them into the banking system. But the second is it's not just about opening a bank account for them. It's about how do we then get them into participating in economic growth. So through opening an account, how does all the inflow of money or their incomes come through the banking system? And through that, how do banks become more capable and uh, you know, able to lend to those uh, people on a microcredit basis? So after having opened the bank accounts, 
Uh, the government actually now, the subsidies, the direct benefits, et cetera, that are transferred, that are given to these people are actually transferred directly through these bank accounts. Also, as these inflows happen through the organized system, the banks can actually use that data to see how much money is flowing through their bank accounts and actually are able to lend to these people on a microcredit basis, which was not possible earlier. So I think it's really the expansion of the financial system to the unbanked so far for them not just to open a bank account, but to actually then enable them to get to their next livelihood. We couple that also with special schemes that, again, the banks do. We call them mudra loans, which is nothing but you know very small uh, loans which are given to people on the basis of very proxy kind of basis in which to assess how do people get credit. So it's not always possible to look at the proper organized income, income generating, capability, generating capability of people, but through these proxies, how much utility bills do they pay, what is the kind of money that they spend on education, and through those proxies, we generate microcredit and <coughs> And are you where are you where you think the country should be on financial inclusion? Is it been slower than you would like, or what are the obstacles? Uh, so I would think that to start with, we were much slower than what what it ought to have been. Uh, you know, um, even two three years ago, there was a large population that was actually unbanked. Uh, but now, one of course, with the focus that we put as a country behind it, but also with the availability of technology that enables us to reach out to these people. I think we've made a huge progress in the last two or three years. Uh, there's still a lot more to be done because as I said, it's not just about opening accounts. It's about making those accounts operative. It's about having people live their financial lives through those bank accounts and not buy cash outside the system. So I think we still have a lot more to do, but with the penetration of mobiles, with the penetration of technology in the country, I mean, we have, a billion mobile users in the country. We have 400 million internet users in the country, and 60% of them use internet on mobile. So, you know, that gives us the accessibility to these people, and that enables us to make much more progress from here on. In Sri Lanka, how do you view, uh, there's job creation and then there's entrepreneurship. How, how do you view those two things, and, and what are you doing to help entrepreneurs in your country? You need all types of jobs the formal ones and the informal ones. But you know, we in South Asia, <laughs> or this so-called Indian subcontinent, we've lost our bearings. Where do you want to go in the next uh, 20, 30, 40 years? By 2050, we'll be the most populous region. India will have over 2 billion. Pakistan, Bangladesh, take uh, even Bay of Bengal. I mean, will there be about 3 billion people? And why aren't we looking at that? Why aren't we looking at where we want to go in another two, three, four decades? I mean, we are getting bogged down. We want to be in the same level that you have in the rural areas. You want to be in your hut or you want to be in a, uh, you are talking of patriotism. Look, the young people today want a good life and they are connected to the world. Are we capable of giving it or not? That's, that's, that's the issue. Are we going to do it? Now, as far as the Japanese are concerned, they're wiped out after the war. Where are they today? They planned out and they came on. The Koreans, what were they after the war? Deng Xiaoping had the guts to change uh, China. We are all, I mean, we are still the, what, what Amitya saying called in a different way, the argument of India. Just make up your mind and go to VIT. That's what certainly the young people in Sri Lanka want, and I think a lot of the young people there. Give them the good life and give them the economic development that then take there. There'll be people who will uh, be self-employed, there'll be people who want jobs, but that, that's, that's the way the world economy works. We, we are just, we are not going, we are not tackling the core problem of our region. So as far as Sri Lanka is concerned, whether we are doing it jointly or not, we will even go on our own. We're the first country in Asia to be modernized. Commodore Perry had not gone to Japan at that time. We are the first to open out in South Asia. I've been talking with Prime Minister Sharif also. It's about the time we put all this behind and go ahead. That's all we have to do. Otherwise, the young people will turn on us. <clears throat> Mr. Prime Minister, I wonder what you think about, how, how about Pakistan and this issue of entrepreneurship and the right way to go? I've just uh, answered your question earlier. 
but uh, I said uh, <coughs> Pakistan, uh, of course, has seven, the seventy percent of the population of Pakistan is below the age of six, thirty years, and uh, not only that, uh, we are encouraging private sector, the private banks, to provide loans uh, on easy terms to uh, all the applicants. At the same time, government uh, has doubled its uh, uh, federal uh, federal government's uh, developmental uh, outlay. Uh, you see, <clears throat> uh, it has been doubled in the, in the last uh, two and a half years, and it's going to grow much more. But the government cannot, uh, uh, you see, offer uh, jobs to everybody. This is primarily the, uh, the job of the private sector. And the government has to act as a catalyst, uh, uh, make policies which encourage the private sector to grow and also provide jobs to the uh, jobless. So we are working on that. We have also, as I mentioned, uh, we have come out with various schemes to provide employment to the youth. And uh, the government is also, uh, you see, uh, and, uh, government is not only asking these institutions to bear the uh, the expenditure. Government is also pumping its own money, and uh, uh, also government is uh, trying to uh, to share the interest uh, cost of the of the banks, and the, so that the uh, the interest charge to the applicants is much lower than what the market rate is. Yes, Mr. Nikhil. Oh yes, uh, the. Creating a good quality job is one of a very important uh, objective for South Asian countries because uh, the population is uh, growing and young and uh, uh, although uh, people pay attention to slowing down of China, South Asia has grown even further than before in these uh, couple of years. And also it is now even coming closer to uh, middle income countries or upper middle income countries. So how we can use this growing Young population, innovative population is uh, so important uh, uh, key to, to the uh, future of the uh, region. And uh, there are many things. There is no single solution to this uh, good uh, quality uh, job creation. We need uh, infrastructure investment. It's not just about the investment in the education, but we need the energy to do business. And in that regard, uh, the energy is in shortage in most of uh, South Asian countries. And this uh, lower commodity prices is uh, uh, one opportunity for uh, South Asian countries. But in the longer term, uh, the energy deficit should be solved. And also investment in uh, education, including uh, technical and vocational <laughs> education and training. And uh, as already mentioned, we need to combine the need of a private sector with the supply of uh, such education. And in India, in other Asian countries, we are providing such a, I mean, uh, 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 Tibet, what we call uh, technical and vocational education training, especially uh, uh, using uh, public policy, uh, uh, public-private partnership uh, to uh, meet the uh, need of uh, the uh, public sector and the private sector. And of course, uh, we need uh, the uh, good uh, policies to open up the economy, deregulate the industry. And one of the most single important, uh, uh, I mean, reason that the South Asia picked up the growth is uh, once again, they pursue better, prudent macroeconomic policies, more stable uh, inflation rate, and so on, less fiscal deficit, and uh, Pakistan is on track of IMF program. So that is the basic things to produce uh, uh, jobs and uh, uh, industry. And also, it's important, again, to connect uh, the industry's uh, economy with the uh, rest of the world. In that regard, uh, Bangladesh uh, textile and garment industry is so much uh, uh, growing, and also they are more paying, paying more at attention to safety of a workplace in Bangladesh. We are uh, supporting uh, the such idea to make a factory safer and uh, uh, clean and so on. So that is also important. So uh, to me, there is no single solution. Uh, and microfinance, finance is important, and the inclusive growth is important. If there is a huge gap between the people, uh, poor people uh, don't have an incentive to invest in education, invest in health and to, to the future. So 
all the, these things are important. I think uh, most of, uh, I mean, many, all uh, South Asian countries are making progress in uh, many fronts of what I said. Well, let's move more closely to the question of where the investment will come from and, and the climate for that. Um, in Sri Lanka, China has been a key investor in many of your infrastructure uh, projects. We've heard a lot here at Davos about concerns about a slowing growth in China. Are you concerned about this? What is the nature of the future relationships between your country and China? Chinese assistance has been through the Exim Bank for uh, main infrastructure projects. But we've been expecting a rebalance in the Chinese economy at some stage. From about 2009, the Asian countries have really taken on the response for growth, but China couldn't continue that all the time. It's, it's, it's uh, looking at a rebalance from uh, our view. Maybe it came at a time when the global economy hasn't performed that well. Uh, I find it that China will come through. There may be a bit of turbulence for us as they adjust to the global economy and what, what's uh, happening. But we are seeing the whole uh, character is now becoming private uh, investment. They've already, we've agreed to have a, a dockyard in Hambantota, followed by we are discussing a large scale industrial zone and Chinese style and uh, we've decided we'll go ahead with uh, the port city which will become a separate financial and business district where the UK company laws will apply and there'll be a separate mechanism for uh, resolution of uh, dis legal disputes and uh, so we, we are, it looks as if the, certainly the Chinese seem to be having the money to go in and go ahead. It looks as if uh, from infrastructure, they are, they are trying to move into investments. They're moving their factories and all out into other parts of the uh, world. So that's this, the Colombo is one area we are working with them. But it's not only Chinese, it's open. We are trying to get uh, Indian businesses also to come into the uh, Port City project. We are working with the Japanese on the, uh, Again, on uh, the new new developments, plus planning out the Candy City. Singaporeans are planning out the Trincomalee. So, with Prime Minister was there in Sri Lanka just three weeks ago, and we are coming back in to have a deeper free trade agreement. So, we, I mean, the sea is rough, but we've got to ride it. There are no, no other option. <laughs> in Pakistan, you mentioned the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Um, how do you see, uh, is there actually opportunity to take advantage of what's going on uh, with China to further those ties? Yes, um, it is a $46 billion investment uh, package in three different sectors I mentioned, energy, infrastructure, and of course, railways. Uh, the work is going on. Work on some of the projects already started, and some will be completed uh, by 2018, and the rest uh, up to 2020. 2020. <clears throat> and it's mainly on uh, 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 power sector. Pakistan is building uh, dams, which will produce about uh, three different dams that will produce about uh, 17,000 megawatts. Uh, and <clears throat> it also includes coal power projects uh, uh, in different parts of the country, including uh, uh, solar power plants, as well as windmills. So I think Pakistan is going to produce about maybe uh, 10,000 megawatts of electricity, uh, additional electricity by the end of 2018, and 2017 perhaps we'll be able to have at least uh, 8,000 megawatts of electricity. So this is a huge, uh, uh, program, and at the same time, I must tell you that <clears throat> Pakistan has a very strong uh, private sector. Uh, our private sector is very vibrant, very dynamic. In fact, uh, the biggest setback that we received was in 1971 when the uh, when nationalisation took place uh, uh, in Pakistan. Uh, it nationalised almost everything, including. Uh, small rice husking plants. Uh, so that was a very big setback to Pakistan. We recovered from that in 1990s. When I took office in 1991, I uh, uh, <clears throat> initiated uh, a, 
privatizing policy, denationalization policy, and we denationalized, we very successfully denationalized banks, insurance companies, industries, and uh, other uh, enterprises which originally belonged to the private sector. And all those, uh, you see, private sector banks which were making huge profits before nationalization went into heavy losses. And then uh, after denationalization, now today, I'm told that they are not only making huge profits once again, they are paying uh, uh, taxes worth billions of rupees every year, each one of them, to the government of Pakistan. So uh, our policy is to, to encourage private sector, uh, because uh, if you want to solve the problem of uh, uh, this, uh, you see, job, uh, what you call uh, 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 employment, I think this is where you will get the real results. And then uh, we have uh, a presence of foreign companies in Pakistan for many decades, you see, and they are doing very well uh, in Pakistan. They are investing more money, they are pumping more money into their uh, uh, existing industries and also setting up uh, and building more industries in Pakistan. So uh, <clears throat> uh, Pakistani investors are also investing, you see, money in different sectors today. And one of the most uh, profitable sectors is the power sector, where the rates of return are almost about 27%. So I think uh, uh, not only Pakistani investment is taking place, foreign direct investment is also coming into Pakistan. And we hope that uh, 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 the CPEC will be a, a game changer, CPEC. And it will not only, as I mentioned, benefit Pakistan and China, it will also benefit the uh, other uh, countries in the region. And as mentioned by uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Sri Lanka, that uh, uh, you see, the, out of uh, the six billion people living in, uh, in this world, three billion are living in this region, which include India, China, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, and other SARC countries and Central Asian countries. So I think the future of the world lies here. So much of this foreign investment and these partnerships uh, depend on investor confidence. You know, Professor Yunus, I know you come at this from a different perspective than obviously the prime ministers, and but I'm, I'm wondering what thoughts you have on investor confidence in the region and, and what everybody here can do to encourage that. Well, investor confidence uh, <clears throat> relates to the overall uh, uh, governance situation and the economic pros prosperity, mm -hmm. pros prospect. And uh, there, I would say, um, the issues that I'm raising is also very important. Uh, what do the young people see for them in the future? So that has to tally with the atmosphere of the environment of investment and so on. Uh, with the technology coming in, uh, given the same amount of investment, you'll be employing less and less people because uh, it will not be the same way it is. So the capacity of the investment, foreign investment, domestic investment together, will not generate enough employment opportunity for the number of young people who will be looking for jobs. And uh, given the employment-oriented policies, uh, job creation policies uh, that we're talking about, uh, the young people will be attracted to the cities coming out of the rural areas because that's where the uh, investments are taking place, pockets of investments are taking place. Uh, that creates a mismatch between the uh, rural society versus urban society with the expansion of technology which is reaching out to the every single family today. Like in Bangladesh, uh, the recently I saw that 87% of the families of Bangladesh have uh, mobile phones. So that uh, includes p poor people and everybody that uh, have the mobile phones. Uh, meaning that uh, the access to information to them is universal that's uh, coming up. Uh, so they will see that uh, development and activities are concentrated in areas. Uh, they will be coming to them and creating urbanization problem itself. 
So while I'm promoting at the same time the idea of entrepreneurship, that's the reason that I'm doing that. Entrepreneurship can be anywhere. It doesn't need an urban situation. Uh, entrepreneurship could be right in the rural areas. Uh, so instead of having a smaller number of entrepreneurs investing and job creating, if you have a larger number of entrepreneurs creating job opportunities spread over the whole country, every single region of the country, so you have a better chance to have a better uh, uniform uh, development possibilities and so on. And also at the same time, you have to look for the, uh, the speed at which the wealth concentration is taking place in the region in every single country. Uh, we have been hearing this uh, in Davos, uh, 62 people owning uh, uh, half the wealth of the world. So uh, we should be asking ourselves, how many people in Bangladesh own half the wealth of Bangladesh. How many people in Sri Lanka own uh, half the wealth of Sri Lanka? Uh, the reason that's important information because next year, should there be a lesser number of people owning half the wealth, which will be larger wealth, hopefully, but lesser number owning it, uh, then it's bad news. Because again, that not only disparity in wealth, in which translates into disparity in income, and dissatisfaction in the political circumstances. So we have to address that. We cannot just walk away saying that, OK, our progress is done. We are, uh, our growth rate is high. But uh, where is the growth taking place? For whom? For whose interest? So those issues have to be done so that even the person who's in the remotest areas and um, kind of rejected from the economic situation has a chance. So that chance has to be created by creating the financial system, which we are just discussing, that to unbank people are coming. And there, my point is very clear. I'm saying that given the existing banking system, no matter how you try to persuade them, they are not going to serve the people who are left out. You make policies, few token things will be done, but they are, they are, these banks are universally, not just for the region, banks are created for the rich. They are used to serving the rich. Their whole mechanism is designed for serving the rich. If you ask them to serve the poor, they may, under pressure, do a little bit, but not the real job. In order to do the real job, you have to create bank for the poor. Unless you do that, it's a completely different system. It's not the same system you're applying for the poor people. The whole structure is different. So then the probably uh, expansion of that financial system. Because unless you expand the financial system, today almost half the people, population in the whole region are unbanked people, at least half the people. So it's a huge number of people who are not connected with the bank. So how to do that? Examples are there. Uh, examples are created in the region. It's not something coming from outside. So how to do that? I'm very happy. India is doing very uh, smart thing. I've been saying that, why don't we create banks for the poor people separately? What they have done, in a good step, uh, given licenses to the NGOs who are doing the microcredit to become microcredit banks. So have a legitimate identity as a bank and can become self-sufficient, take uh, deposits from the people around, and invest in the people uh, around them. So this is a good, good system to do that. So this is the entire financial system has to be revisited. Otherwise, all these investments and things will not save us. I want to move to the, some topics of regional integration and infrastructure uh, that have been alluded to earlier. Um, certainly, improving regional prosperity is also about improving trade with each other. Uh, Mr. Nakao, uh, how uh, there have been challenges to this, uh, what should the region be doing? Uh, if uh, we compare the uh, uh, past experiences of uh, East Asia, including China and uh, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. The difference is uh, the East Asia is uh, more integrated in terms of trade and the investment. They invest each other and they trade, and it's a uh, kind of a value chain uh, between factories in the uh, regions, and it is more integrated. So in case of South Asia, because of uh, uh, nationalizing policies and uh, more, I mean, state control, it didn't happen as much as uh, in the East Asia. So. One of the important questions to uh, uh, produce uh, good uh, quality jobs and also growth poverty reduction is uh, how we can connect uh, uh, the uh, countries in the regions uh, over riding uh, some difficulties between countries and have a deregulation for trade system. And also connectivity in some infrastructure like road and the energy is important. So, one of uh, the things uh, ADB is uh, supporting is uh, connecting uh, 
energy uh, resource rich Central Asian countries like uh, natural gas and uh, also the uh, hydropower with the uh, energy deficit uh, South Asia countries. So it's not just within Asian, uh, South Asian countries, but also connecting uh, between South Asia and uh, Central Asia, and also in terms of trade. How to connect to the uh, East Asia is uh, so important. The World Bank says the region needs to spend as much as 2.5 trillion with a T on infrastructure by 2020 to have enough power, water, and roads to serve its population. What's got to happen to fill that gap? So I'd like to uh, mention, uh, stress the importance of uh, revenue raising efforts by countries themselves. So to raise uh, tax revenues uh, by the uh, uh, tax reform like in India, they are now trying too hard to uh, integrate uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, in indirect taxes, uh, co uh, commodity taxes. And that kind of effort is uh, important. And how to make uh, the private uh, sector financial system uh, more serving to the uh, uh, industries and uh, this kind of uh, infrastructure development is important. Uh, Public-private uh, partnership is another way to mobilize resources. So, of course, uh, development banks like uh, ADB and a new uh, partner like uh, AIIB, uh, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, we should partner together to have a good uh, investment in the region. So there are many resources we should uh, fully mobilized. I wonder if in Pakistan, are, do you feel like you're moving fast enough to be able to fill the gap in, in your own country? Well, we have, uh, <clears throat> when you talk about connectivity, we have embarked upon uh, some major mega projects uh, in our region that will harness the markets and resources of our adjoining regions. And uh, we, uh, to quote uh, a few of course, uh, TAPI, which is Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, is a gas pipeline which is now being laid from Turkmenistan right up to India. It will pass uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And that will also meet uh, some of our um, major requirements of uh, gas. And at the same time, there's a Central Asia, South Asia project which will provide, uh, which will supply about 1,000 megawatts of electricity to Pakistan alone. So, uh, uh, and that will be clean and, and uh, cheap energy. So, we are also in the process of uh, building uh, uh, Gawadar, which is the southernmost uh, part of Pakistan. It will be a state-of-the-art uh, 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 port and <clears throat> will facilitate our Central Asian uh, uh, countries to uh, route their goods through Gwadar and to get to the hot waters of the Arabian Sea. So it's, it's, it is a gigantic uh, uh, project and uh, we'll also like other regions, not only Central Asia, but also South Asian region to, uh, to benefit from this. We are uh, trying to establish uh, both Pakistan and Afghanistan trying to establish long-lasting peace in Afghanistan. So if uh, we achieve peace in Afghanistan, of course, there are a number of other projects that we can do together. And uh, uh, both Pakistan and India, uh, once uh, we're able to normalize our relationship and resume the, the composite dialogue, the comprehensive dialogue, I think both countries have tremendous potential to cooperate with each other and to, uh, to have uh, good economic cooperation. As the CEO of one of India's largest banks, how do you feel about progress toward filling that infrastructure gap? So first of all, as you spoke about uh, the inter-regional uh, cooperation, uh, you know, as we talk about the South Asia as a region, we say, you know, quarter of the world's population uh, and uh, quarter of the middle class and, you know, all that. But at the same time, when we look at our trade of this entire region, 95% of that is externally focused. That means less than 5% actually gets done within the region. So I think there's huge scope for improving and increasing this inter-regional cooperation and, and trade. And all the TAPI, the CASA are all initiatives in that direction. And we should, we should make those happen more and more. Um, the second thing about uh, the overall infrastructure <coughs> requirement and where would this come from, Again, you know, when we talk of this region, uh, I think the, the biggest advantage that this region has as far as infrastructure requirement is concerned is that as these infrastructure projects will get put up in this region, 
they will all be inherently viable in the sense that we are creating infrastructure when demand already exists. So it's unlike the saturated developed economies where you build bridges hoping somebody uses it. In, in this region, we all need the infrastructure. So I think once the projects are implemented, actually there's inherent demand. So in that sense, they are viable projects to implement. But I think every source of finance needs to work here because just one or two would not be sufficient to meet the requirements. So we need to have foreign investment coming in. We need to have the private sector to be vibrant. We need to have the public or the uh, public sector or the government spends to come in. We also need in our all our countries capital markets to become more vibrant. We need the financial markets to become deeper. So I think each one of these things needs to be done uh, to meet the uh, entire requirement of infrastructure that we have. You're a region that benefits from low oil. How, how does the region take advantage of that even more now, given what's happened? Um, Mr. Nakal, I know you, have, you mentioned uh, oil and yeah, low energy yes, prices. Uh, the, once again, the lower commodity prices are uh, challenges for exporters, and uh, it is also uh, uh, related to the volatility of the financial market, uh, because many oil producers have difficulties of uh, the uh, budget and so on. But at the same time, overall, South Asian countries are uh, uh, energy importers. It might cause uh, some troubles to revenues of uh, budget, uh, because sometimes uh, the uh, uh, taxes uh, add value or uh, uh, according to the value of uh, oil prices. So if it goes down, it would uh, mean that uh, there'll be less revenue. But if uh, we can adjust uh, to the lower oil prices, of course it is a benefit. So how we can use this uh, benefit in South Asian countries? And uh, once again, uh, using uh, growing and uh, uh, innovative population, uh, young population, it's advantage to China because uh, China is now starting having, uh, uh, I mean, constraint to the labor force. So. How we can use these opportunities? Uh, that is uh, uh, one important policy issue for South Asia. How about in your countries, uh, Pakistan or Sri Lanka? Um, what does the low price of oil mean to you? Uh, some of you have talked about uh, renewable energy commitments and, and those kinds of things. Um, it has helped us uh, and also perhaps negative uh, in many ways you see, it helped us because the oil prices are, have come down and uh, <clears throat> people also have a sigh of relief. But at the same time, government uh, has also started uh, losing a lot of money in the revenue that it earned from the import of oil. And the government revenues in this particular sector have gone down, whereas I think overall the country has really benefited from, uh, from uh, lowering of oil prices. The electricity tariff has come down enormously, and uh, the uh, industries now find this tariff more competitive as compared to many other countries. So we've passed on uh, the reduction on oil prices to the people of the country. Government uh, didn't retain much of uh, what uh, uh, the reduction was. So people are generally very happy because previously the oil prices, you see, were very high and uh, uh, and the industry was not very competitive. So I think in many ways it has helped us, and in some ways it is little, uh, you see, uh, negative as well. Hmm. How about in Sri Lanka? Is there a downside? Well, I would say the lowering of oil prices generally has been helpful, but uh, we should not lose sight of the fact that we need alternate sources of energy. That may be the downside. All of a sudden, you forget about it. Yeah. That is a really uh, important point to uh, emphasize, that uh, we uh, made a commitment to the climate change issues. And the uh, low oil prices, if it means that we waste uh, energy, we don't uh, prepare for the future, and we don't uh, uh, tackle the climate uh, uh, issues, uh, it's uh, bad. So we need to pay attention, invest in the renewable energies and other alternative sources. And even if it is uh, using uh, the uh, carbon uh, energy, we should uh, use uh, those energy more efficiently. So we need more attention to that. Yeah, so to talk about India, I mean, India is a huge importer of oil. So uh, a $1 reduction per barrel uh, in, in the cost of oil, in fact, 
changes our import requirement for by about a billion dollars in that sense per annum. So uh, I think what India has done uh, currently is to use that benefit uh, in two ways, partly to reduce the costs for the end consumers themselves, partly to create this saving as a kitty to start investing in either roads or you know, creating some amount of infrastructure. So I think at this point in time, the momentary benefit that we all have, we should use this, uh, this, this period to you know, use those savings in some productive manner. But in the long term, I think we have to focus on the alternate sources of energy as well. So simultaneously, as we are taking advantage of the reduced oil prices, uh, in India, we are talking of a target at least of 175 gigawatts of energy uh, capacity uh, arising out of renewable energy to be set up. So uh, it's absolutely right. We have to use the benefit as it comes today. But for a sustainable growth, we have to keep our focus on the other sources of energy. We're nearing the end of our time, and I want to uh, spend it talking a little bit about uh, what things look like 12 months from now. Hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll be back here and, and talking about the progress that's been made. Mr. Prime Minister, we, what, what does success look like to, to you 12 months from now? We will come to know when we cross the bridges. <laughs> <laughs> A, a smart man, perhaps, does not make, uh, make predictions. Uh, how about you in Sri Lanka, Mr. Prime Minister? Sri Lanka. <laughs> same, same as true. As I said, as the Prime Minister said, Harold Wilson said, a week is a long time in politics, so you're talking of 52 weeks. <laughs> no, it's a question of how we in India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, how, how we make use of this opportunity to, to get a... Uh, country ahead, we've got a glorious opportunity. The whole uh, the global value chain is changing the economics of the, and they all discussed about the fourth industrial revolution, digitalization, manufacturing. Those opportunities, I mean, which which uh, means you can go ahead. And uh, I hope we have better news and results when we come on next uh, when the OC sale next time. But uh, at the same time, I say that we in Sri Lanka also sympathizes and supports Pakistan at the moment when it's engaged in a battle with terror. Thank you. <laughs> um, Mr. Nakal, very briefly, I wonder if you could sum that question up from the regional perspective. What does success look like to you in 12 months? Yeah, it's very difficult to, to tell the future. But uh, uh, I hope that the, uh, this region, I mean, South Asia, would provide uh, impetus and optimism to the global economy in one year, two years, and so on. So because we are now uh, prevailed by the very strong uh, pessimist about, uh, pessimistic views about the future of a global economy, but uh, as far as South Asia, it has had uh, progress. And also, uh, the poverty reductions have uh, made a progress. So I hope that in 12 years, uh, 12 months, South Asia would provide even more optimistic uh, view about the future of a global economy. Our time is done. That's it for the AP debate in Davos. I want to thank all of you for a very lively discussion. And we'll all be back in 12 months to see how they did. Okay.